thank you Bharat, for such a glorious introduction. I don't know whether I deserve it, but the point is, uh, I have seen Maharashtra happening from my school days. I was not party to the Sayyukta Maharashtra movement. And in time, at the time of school, at entire atmosphere in the state was completely for Mumbai getting into Maharashtra and forming Sayyukta Maharashtra. That was the atmosphere across. Now that this is the 60th year, exactly 60 years ago in 1960 when the state was formed, I was studying in school in the 10th standard. And uh, the entire atmosphere in the city was quite charged because Mumbai was finally merged in Maharashtra or Maharashtra became with Mumbai as its capital in 1960. Now the questions that are being posed today regard themselves to the history 60 years before and prior to that. Many people have many misconceptions based on either ignorance or uh, disinterestedness about why and how Maharashtra was created. The idea actually of having a linguistic state is not after independence. It was actually somewhere in the 1920s, ideally speaking, 1970, immediately after Mahatma Gandhi came from South Africa. People were discussing, because that time there was no question of it. Nobody knew independence was to come in 1947. So between 1917 and 1927, there used to be a big debate inside the Congress about how to organize the Congress movement for freedom. So at that point, Mahatma Gandhi mooted the idea that if we can spread the message through different linguistic provinces, that time there were only definitive provinces created by the British. So he said if there is a regular activist group in Tamil Nadu, that time Tamil Nadu didn't exist, actually Madras, Mysore were all together, even Andhra was part of it. So those Tamil speaking people should have a separate group of activists for Congress. Therefore, in the Hindi belt, it was only Hindi. Many people misunderstand when linguistic states are being discussed. Let us not forget that Madhya Pradesh is Hindi speaking, Rajasthan is Hindi speaking, Uttar Pradesh is Hindi speaking, Bihar is Hindi speaking, Himachal Pradesh is Hindi speaking. So if the linguistic formation of states was to be taken according to its perfect logic, precise logic, then entire Hindi land should have been one state. But that was never an idea. The idea was, how do you communicate the Congress message in various parts of the country? At that time, the definitive notion of India also didn't exist because Pakistan was part of India, Bangladesh didn't exist, so Bangladesh was part of India. Actually, even Myanmar was part of India. As you might know, Lokmane Tilak was arrested and put in Mandali, which is Myanmar. Or Subhash Chandra Bose was arrested and put in Mandali, which was Myanmar, and which is Myanmar today. And they were all part of India. So the question of division of India for reorganization of linguistic states, the idea did not exist in this form that we discussed today. It existed only for the communication of the message of the freedom movement. That was in the 1927, uh, 1917 and 1927. Then came, perhaps you know, that in 1917 there was a revolution in Russia. And in Russia there were 15 republics. You know, so many, Ukraine, Russia, Belarusia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, so many states. So at that time, the project was going on in Soviet Union, that is, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, how to have the administrative control of the entire Soviet Union. They were also debating the same issue. This question did not come at all in United States of America, even after independence. This question did not appear as a frontal item even in UK. Because all the four kingdoms of the United Kingdom were English speaking. In America, it was majority, 90% was English speaking. That is American English. Later, only very recently, when the Spanish also acquired more than 10% of the population, then they started introducing Spanish language. Or in Canada, there was only French because Quebec was part of French language and rest of the area is English speaking. So these questions which were faced by Soviet Union between 1917 and 1927 or later and the questions that were not actually relevant at that point of time because India was not free between 1917 and later have to be seen in that context. So Soviet Union was becoming a new format, not exactly new icon, 
format of administration, how will they govern the state, which is Soviet Union state, from Ukraine to Belarusia to Azerbaijan? Because there were so many languages. So the idea of linguistic reorganization was discussed in Soviet Union between 1917 and 1940, but they did not implement it the way we implemented. Simple point is, between 1977 and 1917 and 1947, in these 30 years, a lot of water has flown for understanding how to administer the country after independence. When the country was partitioned in 1947 on religious grounds, the subject cropped up again. At that time, there was no constitution. The constitution was being framed in 1946 to 1947. When we got freedom, there was no constitution. There was only Indian independence declared, but Indian India had not become republic. So the idea of linguistic states was further delayed between 1947 and 1950. First elections were held in 1952. In that time, there was no Maharashtra. There was no Andhra Pradesh. You know, the linguistic state didn't exist. After 1952 elections, when the idea of spreading the message of that particular party, again, the issue that was dogging the minds of the freedom fighters, how to communicate your idea to your people. And that's how the question came. And first it was raised very violently, was in Andhra Pradesh, today's Andhra Pradesh. At that time, there was no Andhra Pradesh. So one chap who was an activist, a very big activist, freedom fighter also, Mr. Shiramulu, he went on indefinite hunger strike sometime in 1955, and he died. And as a result of that death, consequently, a huge mass movement was launched to form or to demand Andhra Pradesh. That is based on Telugu language. Actually, that triggered the idea of Maharashtra. You know, people talk about idea of India, idea of Pakistan. Similarly, we must discuss idea of Maharashtra. So the idea of Maharashtra, actually, idea of Maharashtra in pure, pure sociological sense existed long time ago. Like Marathi language has been there ever since Dhaneshwari. From 1290 is the date of the Dhaneshwari. So from Dhaneshwari to Marathi, so the, so the question of Marathi, Marathi language and being proud of Marathi language is not part of the same to Maharashtra movement that was there even before. Even in 19th century, when the first newspaper in Maharashtra started, Darpan, the idea of Marathi language, the pride in Marathi language was there. So that is in 1832. And after that, the entire, all the movements between Mahatma Phule's movement, Shahu Maharaj's movement, Vasudev Brown Phalke's movement, Chiprunkar, all of them were essentially Marathi speaking with a lot of pride in Marathi language. Lokmanya Tirak, Gokhale, Agarkar, Karu, everybody from Mahatma Phule down to even Lokande, who was a training leader, all of them were essentially Marathi speaking. They were addressing their issues in Marathi to the Marathi people. So the question of pride in being Marathi has always been there. It has little to do directly with the administrative concept of Sayyukta Mahathir. So let us first completely delineate, completely delineate the issue of pride which you mentioned, the chauvinism, the so-called Marathi chauvinism, Marathi Abhiman, Marathi Asmita from administrative aspect of the Marathi state. So that idea was being discussed between 1917 and 1947. After 1947, when the constitution was formed in 1950, after partition, the debate began again. That if this country could be divided on the basis of religion, Pakistan and India, that time Bangladesh didn't exist. Pandit Nehru said, if we start introducing additional divisive aspects, apart from religion, into language, we will further balkanize India. Balkanize, the idea of balkanization comes from Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, now Yugoslavia doesn't exist. Yugoslavia at that point of time was an integrated country of various Balkan states. Serbia, Bosnia, Slovenia, Montenegro. These were all the Balkan states which were integrated into one Yugoslavia. And later on, Yugoslavia also got split in 1992 onwards to 1999, and it became seven states, just as Soviet Union got split again into 15 republics, mainly on the linguistic origins. So this fear was there. Pandit Nehru said, if this country could be divided on the basis of language, apart from the question of religion, then we will be finding it very difficult to unite and integrate India as an Indian psyche. So Nehru at that point of was opposed to the idea 
of Maharashtra on the basis of language, and that's why the question of Mumbai became important. I'm not saying who is right, who is wrong. I'm just giving you plain history, completely unbiased, which you can see anytime, which, which you can read if it is published anywhere. So Pandit Nehru said, let us not try to divide, let us try to unite. As he said, that the entire Hindi belt is one Hindi language up to Punjab. Perhaps many people don't know, in Punjab, when the census people went to ask, what is your language, mother tongue, many people used to write Hindi and some people used to write Gurumukhi. Then the Akali movement started. And Akali was talking about the pride of Gurumukhi. And so Akali movement said, at that point of time, that let us write when the census people come, our mother tongue, our language is Gurumukhi and not Hindi. Actually, most of the people were speaking Gurumukhi. Or let us take Kok, uh, Goa. In Goa, Kokan was being spoken, but Kokan did not have its own script. Kok Kokni language did not have its own script. So Kokni language people were using either Roman script or Marathi script, that is Devanagari script. But even then, the pride in Kokni language was so much that there were riots in Kokan, in Goa part of the Kokan. So, point is Marathi culture, Marathi asmita, Marathi abhiman, Marathi pride are all the aspects of particular linguistic culture. They have nothing to do with the administrative aspect of Maharashtra. That is why even today, even today, the same Marathi speaking region of Vidarbha wants separate Vidarbha. In fact, the BJP has a regular resolution passed that when they come to power or they will fight for separate Vidarbha. And actually, Devendra Pandis, a former chief minister, had been appealing for a separate Vidarbha. Even Nitin Gadkari had been doing. Now they have stopped. Now they have put it on the back burner. But the point is, Vidarbha now speaking Marathi language. So despite having pride in Marathi, they want a separate Vidarbha. Similarly, Punjab and Haryana were created finally when the Akali movement started for Guru Mukhi. So let us not unduly put the pride aspect, Asmita aspect into administrative governance aspect of the, of the Indian subcontinent. Because Indian subcontinent, particularly India, there are many people who do not know that there are something like 1,000 dialects in our country. 1,000 dialects, maybe 18 what you can call official languages, but 1,000 dialects. And most dialects, people are pride about their dialects, very proud of their dialects. Malwani, Ahirani, their Kokni, all, they are proud of their dialects. But that doesn't mean the dialect should be the ocean for defining linguistic state. So the linguistic state idea between 1947 and 1955 when Andhra Pradesh was created and 1960 Maharashtra was created is not the same. It has been evolving according to the sentiments of the people. And that's why the question of Mumbai became important because Mumbai, the characteristic, sociological characteristic of Mumbai was very different. Most of the businesses, you can say almost 65 to 70 percent of the businesses, main large businesses, all the mills for instance, all the mills, textile mills, there were about 62 textile mills employing about 2.5 lakh workers. Now look at the division. All the 2.5 lakh workers were Marathi. And all the mills were owned by either Gujaratis or Marwadi. So the division in Mumbai was mill owners, that is industrialists, that is the capitalists, the big traders, they were all Gujarati or Marwadi. And the people working there were Marathi. So there was an inbuilt, what you can call, a conflict between two interest groups. One is the capitalist interest group, one is the working class interest group. Now, there is no language in that involved. It's a class conflict, but it slowly acquired even the language dimension because my language, I am comrade of so many workers and I am being governed by somebody who doesn't speak my language, but he is my owner. He is employing me. I am his quote unquote slave to use that language. And therefore, Marathi population in Mumbai began to feel that entire trade and industry is controlled by Gujaratis and Marwadis and entire workforce. Almost entire workforce, not completely. Almost entire workforce happens to be Marathi. So are Marathi people slaves of these people? You know, that's how the idea of conflict began to evolve. So it is not directly connected with the linguistic reorganization or linguistic governance. But this idea spread. And moreover, interestingly, all these workers, like textile workers, primarily they came from where? Primarily they came from only two or three regions. Primarily two. One is Kokan. Majority of the textile workers were from Kokan and also from Satara Karad region. 
Western Maharashtra region. Nobody came in Mumbai as textile workers from Vidarbha. Nobody came from Marathwada as a textile worker. Nobody came from Khandesh, North Maharashtra, as a textile worker. For that matter, nobody came from Pune as a textile worker. Majority of the textile workers came from either Kokan or Western Maharashtra, that is the Satara Karaj Sangli region. Now, these Marathi people who were trying to integrate themselves thought language as an integration point. And in that integration point, as you know, in every social movement, you require a hostile element. You require an enemy, quote unquote enemy. Enemy is not exactly, it is not rival. It's a, you require an enemy. You have to blame somebody for uniting. Who is, who is not allowing me to come together? The owners. Who are they? They are Gujarati or Marwadi. And who am I? I am Marathi. So that's how so many identities coerced. And some, some of these identities became an integrationist factor. But interestingly, that Mumbai should become part of Maharashtra was a movement only in Mumbai, in Kokan, and in Satara and Karadpet. That movement was not there in Maratwada. That movement was not there in Vidarbha. Vidarbha wanted its own state, independent state, uh, uh, independent within the linguistic formation. So, Vidarbha was not part of Mumbai, sir, Sayyukta, Maharashtra, Zala, Paije. That was the demand in Mumbai, in Kokan, and this part. So, why Mumbai became important? Because Mumbai was truly and continues to be, even today, a cosmopolitan city. You may recall about uh, 15 or 20 years ago, Uddhav Thakre himself, now the current chief minister, that time he was a relatively junior leader of the Shiv Sena. He said, I am a Mumbaiker first. Now, Shiv Sena had grown on the question of Marathi pride. Shiv Sena was formed to protect and promote the Marathi identity, Marathi culture. Even then, Uddhav Thakre, about 15, 20 years ago, in a public meeting organized, in which there were industrialists, there were intellectuals, there were economists, he said, I am a Mumbaiker first. Mumbaiker clearly meant he is multilingual, multicultural, multireligious. In that sense, he is a cosmopolitan. So, Uddhav Thakre had recognized the fact that Mumbai is a cosmopolitan city and he represents Mumbai, meaning he represents cosmopolitan culture of Mumbai despite being 100% Marathi. So his idea was, Marathi is the main language, main lingua franca of this metropolis. It must be protected and promoted because it is the main, main stay of this culture. But Mumbai's actual social life is cosmopolitan and therefore I am Mumbaikar. I think Uddhav Thakri was that time changing the course slightly, not much, keeping Marathi pride, but into the broader cosmopolitan framework. So it is necessary to understand why Mumbai became crucial is because entire Gujarati community, not only in Mumbai, but part of Gujarat, they said, no, 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 it can't be Mumbai with Maharashtra because they knew that it was basically a class conflict between the workers and the owners. Owners belong to Gujarati community and they all came from Gujarat or Rajasthan. So the class conflict then entered into broader linguistic conflict between Gujarati and Marathi. Later on, we saw Shiv Sena having fights with uh, South Indians, then also later on with uh, North Indians. But at that point of time, it did not become too violent. But main conflict in the Sayyidu Maharashtra movement was between Marathi and Gujarati, not between South Indians and uh, North Indians and Marathi people. So that was because it was having naturally a class conflict dimension. So it is necessary to understand this particular type of cosmopolitan versus Marathi conflict did not exist in any part of Maharashtra. It did not exist in Vidarbha, Marathwada, North Maharashtra, Western Maharashtra, Pune, nowhere. The question of cosmopolitanism came only to Mumbai. And because Mumbai was truly cosmopolitan, it had all kinds of people from all over the country, in fact, all over the world. And therefore, Mumbai had to be different. That was Pandit Nehru's point. Pandit Nehru at that point of thought, uh, at that time, he thought that in Mumbai can become like Singapore or Hong Kong, a major trade center. Because sometime in the 16th century, Mumbai had become the major port for the trade. And ever since that trade began to evolve, particularly after the fall of Constantinople, after the fall of Constantinople, people were looking, the traders were looking, global traders were looking for different routes. And Mumbai was identified as one of the centers. And Mumbai here and Surat there in Gujarat were the two centers identified for 
trade purposes. And that's how Mumbai began to grow. If the trade did not develop in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, Surat and Mumbai would not have grown. Mumbai had a facility of a wonderful port. So Mumbai grew much more than Surat. But at that point of time, Surat and Mumbai were comparable, early part, early part they were comparable as two trading centers. If the trade had not developed, Mumbai would not have become cosmopolitan. It is trade which made Mumbai cosmopolitan center. And therefore, the so-called cosmopolitanism of Mumbai dates back to 16th century. And that's how that legacy was maintained. And that is why many people who were neither Gujarati nor Marwadi, nor owners, nor capitalists, nor big traders, but they thought, many people thought, who were neither Marathi nor Gujarati Marwadi, that Mumbai should remain cosmopolitan and Mumbai should not become part of Maharashtra because Mumbai is different. Mumbai is like an international city. Mumbai is like a global city. Later on, Mumbai was compared with uh, Shanghai and sometimes it was compared with New York and London. Shanghai is not correct comparison because in Shanghai, most of the people speak Chinese. But London and New York were the cities compared for Mumbai. So the issue of Mumbai became crucial because the Marathi speaking people in Mumbai always felt that they are being marginalized. They are neglected in their own area. And it is because of the class conflict. So we must have our own state, our own state, our own capital. And that's how Mumbai became a crucial, contentious issue in the moment. But that does not mean that everybody was agreed. In fact, Pandit Nehru opposed to the extent that Pandit Nehru was considered as a killer. Acharya Atre, who was one of the architects of uh, Maharashtra, used to say Pandit Nehru is our main enemy at that point of time. So those people today, those people today who do not understand history or who do not care for history, completely misunderstand what was going on. Pandit Nehru agreed at the end of the day, after 1959, that if you do not grant the sentiment of the people, not the reality, the sentiment of the people is important. Sentiment of the people was recognized in Andhra Pradesh and Andhra Pradesh was created. Therefore, sentiment has to be recognized. Sentiment of the people was recognized in Punjab, Haryana, Nagaland. So many places sentiment was recognized. Sentiment defines some of the political processes and administrative issues define only the structure of the government. So I think let us not mix up pride with sentiment, pride with administration and governance, and pride with your existing prejudices or past prejudices that Nehru created linguistic states, Nehru did not. Nehru was only part of the Congress movement's resolution in the 1917-1927 that for the spread of the freedom movement, it is necessary to have language as the communication medium, communication tool, communication instrument. And that's why the linguistic formations emerged during the freedom movement. That was necessary. That helped India to integrate its freedom movement. And that helped India to gain independence. After independence, how to reorganize, the commission was appointed to reorganize the states according to language. And that did not. In fact, the initial reports are against Mumbai becoming part of Maharashtra or even getting sanctioned for the Maharashtra as a linguistic state. Then the formula came that let there be Maharashtra state without Mumbai. Then there was a formula that let Mumbai become a bilingual state. It was a bilingual state for quite some time. When Moraji Desai was chief minister of Mumbai between 1952 and 1956, it was a bilingual state. Even Y.B. Chauhan was the chief minister between 1956 and 1960 of the bilingual state. It was a Bombay state. And Bombay state included parts, included parts of Karnataka, parts of Gujarat. So that has geographically evolved, culturally evolved, linguistically evolved. And I will not be completely ready to bet. I will not bet that one day Vidarbha will not become separate. I don't know. Vidarbha can become one day, maybe in distant future or near future, whatever. Become. Nobody knew till very recently that Jharkhand will be separated from Bihar. Nobody knew very recently, till recently, that Uttarakhand will be separated from Uttar Pradesh. Nobody knew very recently that Chhattisgarh will be created out of Madhya Pradesh. They also had their own pride. But they were linguistic, linguistic and linguistic reorganization of the states, particularly based, mainly based on sentiment and not necessarily on the logical notions of the governance 
or laws should be made. So let us be clear that politics is also conducted not only on issues, it is also conducted on sentiments. One of the dominant sentiment in Mumbai and Maharashtra was that Marathi should be the lingua franca, Marathi pride should remain, and Sayukta Maharashtra should be there with Mumbai as the capital. In short, I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you for a lovely, lovely talk. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Uh, so I'll be. Uh, uh, let's start with the first question, which uh, Sneha, who, who is our host today, so she asked the first question even before you came online. Yeah. So she said, "This is my question. A hypothetical situation. If you were to look at it, if Mumbai had become a union territory, right, or Mumbai had gone to Gujarat, one of the two scenarios." Uh, what would Mumbai be today, in your view? Mumbai could have become union territory, like Chandigarh is, yes. or like Delhi is. Yeah. But if Mumbai had become union territory, it would have completely destroyed the idea of Maharashtra as it was emerging after independence between 1950 and 1960, after formation of Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Because the pride had begun to take shape. So Mumbai could have administratively, comfortably become a union territory and Mumbai could have become Singapore or Hong Kong. Mumbai could have been administered. Even today there are demands that like New York, New York has mayor and who takes major decisions. Mumbai should have a publicly elect, elected mayor and Mumbai should be separate. Hmm. Actually at one point of time when Vasundha Patil said that is a plot hmm. of some Gujarati elements, hmm. there was a huge movement against uh, that plot and Shiv Sena got strengthened because of that. Hmm. So it is, as I said, it was possible that doesn't mean it would have happened hmm. because if it was to happen they would have to contain the sentiment of the marathi people which had already crossed a certain rubicon certain border hmm. so uh, the question is whether i liked it or not is immaterial hmm. i like so many things uh, and they don't happen okay uh, um, when when we look at the uh, when the uh, Silver Jubilee came up and they extended the Hutatma Smarak Memorial, they added the 107 Hutatma names there. And many of these 106. names... 106. They have added a seventh recently. That's why I'm saying. Yeah. So recently uh. somebody has added a seventh, 107th one. So uh, the question I wanted to ask is, many of the names are actually non-Marathi. Now, yeah, correct. were they collateral damage or they were supporters of Sayyidat Maharaj? Love no, no. Actually, they were also bystanders. Okay. You know, the firing was quite reckless. Mm. And there were huge morchas every day. Every day there used to be big demonstration, big morcha. And so every time to control the morcha, sometimes it would become violent. So to control the morcha, the police would open lati charge, tear gas and fire. Now in that fire, some people died, but they were not exactly participants in the morcha, but they were supporters of the movement. But they were bystanders. They were not actually in the Morcha. Mm. They were bystanders mm. and perhaps giving a slogan or perhaps waving their hand in support of the Morcha. But not necessarily. Mm. Majority of them, or quite a large number of them, were bystander supporters mm. and not necessarily part of the mm. regular movement. But they were supporters. Mm. And, you know, uh, let us not forget that non Gujarati, non Marwadi elements mm. in Mumbai were supporters of. Uh, Mumbai with Maharashtra okay. movement. Like Parsis were supporting, Sindhis were supporting, so many others were supporting. They were not saying that Mumbai should be separate or Mumbai should be bilingual. They thought that their life, their social life, their cultural life, their economic life is so much governed, integrated with Marathi workforce. And so they they also felt uh, quite distanced yeah. from the Gujarati Marwadi ownership. Yeah. And so they were siding with the Maharashtra movement. Okay. Uh, uh... There's a question which is asked by Yogi Raj, who is from Alibag, and uh, from? from Alibag. He is connected from Alibag. Okay. So he's asking a question which is uh, pertinent to Kokani people. Okay. So he's saying yeah. Kokani people traditionally are very religious, even when they are in a diaspora, other places and all. How did they get attracted to the communist movement, which is more, uh, you know, which is, keeps people away from religion and so on and so forth? So how did they get attracted and how was the relationship? And the added question I would like to ask that how did the transformation happen from communist to Shiv Sena later on? So if you can just explain that also. I think uh, this is a question um, based on some presumption. Hmm. Let us not forget that majority of the 
hard Catholic countries became communist first. Mm. And after communism disappeared from Soviet Union, many countries went back to Catholicism. Mm. But in between 1905 and 1917, mm. many, many of the communists were from Catholic or from what they call Russian Orthodox Church. Mm. So they were supporting Russian Orthodox Church and communists. Actually, one of the leading authors in Europe, very big author, Graham Greene. Graham Greene was attracted towards communism. After the communism failed and Soviet Union disappeared, Graham Greene was asked, how did you become communist? His answer was, because I was a confirmed Catholic, I could easily become a communist. <laughs> now, this answer, many people will be surprised to understand. Similarly, you will find so many Brahmins, hardcore Brahmins or hardcore elite class, even the upper class, becoming communists. Like many of the communist leadership is from Parsi rich people. Yeah. Chaklatwala was a big Parsi man. There are many, so many. Our Meghna Desai yeah. today is a Gujarati man. He was a comrade. So, so many rich people, even Gujarati is rich, Gujarati rich also people became yeah. communists. So, whether Kokni people becoming communists and joining Shiv Sena yeah. later, I don't think that's a, uh, you know, kind of one-to-one -one relationship. People get influenced. Sometimes they get influenced, sometimes they get carried away by various multiple ideas. You can be simultaneously a religious person and still believe in socialism or communism. You can be a hardcore religious person and still ready to make profits recklessly without observing any ethical norms. So his religion does not come in between uh, making a profit or black market or uh, you know kind of anything that he does which is not necessarily accepted by the religion or religious morality. So religious morality, religious observance, religious faith and political line getting influenced or getting carried away, they are not mutually exclusive but they can become mutually exclusive in period of crisis or period of movement. Right. Uh, Chandrasekhar Nene was asking whether the central communist leadership approve of the participation in Sayukta Maharashtra? Communist leadership was one major factor, but not the only. Hmm. There were actually, Hindu Mahasabha was also supporting the Sayukta Maharashtra movement. Okay. Now, Hindu Mahasabha is not communist, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Hindu Mahasabha yeah. is not communist, but no, no. Hindu Mahasabha... So the question Hindu is, Mahasabha, central leadership of communists... I am saying, yeah. central leadership of the Communist Party yeah. had two views on the uh, uh, Mumbai Maharashtra. Okay, okay. One view was that if Mumbai remains separate, yeah. Mumbai can become a working class city, a working class dominant city, yeah. because working class dominated the city. Okay. Second version was, Mumbai is dominated by Marathi working class, so it will be a Marathi working class dominated communist Marathi city. Mm -hmm. That was also one of the points. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody had different, slightly different point of view. Ambedkar had different point of view. Comrade Dange had different point of view. Within communist party, there were two, three points of view. Not everybody was fully mm -hmm. supporting the Sayyid Kumar mm -hmm. movement. But on the basis of the ultimate analysis, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what mattered was, what the majority of the people, what majority of the sentiment is. Mm -hmm. So even Communist Party had to support mm -hmm. the Sayyid Kumar movement. Mm -hmm. Socialist Party was divided on that issue. Mm -hmm. Jansen did not support, but Hindu also supported. Yeah. So it is not a question of Hindus and... Okay. Uh, Ameya Kulkani is a bit angry that he has privately sent me some questions and they have not been answered. So uh, one you mentioned about Hindu Mahasabha and uh, Savarkar. Uh, he... Uh, People would like to understand more about uh, there are more prominent uh, Marathi speaking people like Karve or uh, there were people like uh, Ambedkar. Uh, what was their view on the uh, movement? Karve and Ambedkar. Sa Savarkar, you clarified with Hindu Mahasabha supporting it. Yeah, no, no, but uh, see, you must remember Savarkar was a great supporter hmm. and a great uh, man to defend Marathi language. Mm. In fact, he created words mm. in Marathi as uh, alternatives to Sanskrit, alternatives to Urdu, alternatives to Farsi, and he was very stubborn about yeah. using Marathi language. So his, his faith in Marathi was complete, which okay. was not necessarily the same case with the Jansang or the RSS. Okay. And therefore, Hindu Vasava supported Sayyid Maharashtra because mm. they also thought Marathi sentiment must be supported. So mm. let us not mix up that with the other. Mm. Ambedkar supported uh, to Master movement later on. Initially, he was also thinking whether it should be bilingual or not because he found out that majority of the workforce mm. or the people who are oppressed are mm. Dalits and they are mm. all Marathi. 
there were hardly any dalits in mumbai hmm. or maharashtra who were non marathi hmm. there are of course hmm. there are of course gujarati dalits and all, but they were not the part of the mumbai life right. mumbai's social and economic and cultural life hmm. belong to marathi speaking people hmm. marathi theater hmm. marathi arts marathi folk arts marathi painting marathi exhibitions all that was essentially marathi and dalit writers dalit painters dalit artists in the films and so on and so forth hmm. they were dominant so ambedkar also realized that marathi sentiment has to be respected okay um next question i would like to ask some of no have i have i answered amay's question does, does he have problem with i think so if not i'll i'll come back again because he uh, yeah. uh, there's one more question by amay which i'll take up later um, i'll start with media okay and that time television didn't exist and radio was not independent newspapers right uh, most of the uh, english speaking newspapers were against the sayukta maharashtra viewpoint okay correct me if i'm wrong and uh, marathi papers uh, other than lok satta because uh, hara mahajani the editor of lok satta uh, was against uh, sayukta maharashtra uh, movement now if you can explain and international media was also reporting uh, uh, from whatever i was reading other than taya zinkin where she uh, reports at a worker level i mean what was happening on ground you know from chols in girgaon and all that stuff otherwise most of the viewpoint was elitist when it came to media other than marathi media so how was uh, you know this uh, panning out at that point of time in terms of marathi media versus the rest well actually maharashtra times did not exist at all maharashtra times was there in 1962 born yeah. lok satta was there yes. earlier to 1960 and lok satta was quite opposed mm. and not because owners were opposed mm. there was a significant so called self style cosmopolitan community even among maharashtrians right. who thought mumbai should be separate mm. and they also thought because they were hardcore anti left anti socialist and anti communist mm. and they were seeing in sayukt maharashtra movement sm joshi comrade dange datta deshmukh and for that matter prabodhan ka thakre mm. and you know all these people acharya atre they were clearly openly leftists mm. Prabodhan Ka Thakre, many people don't realize, was completely on the left as far as the issues of right and left are concerned right. in those days. He was associate of all these people. Right, right. So those people who were against the leftist ideology thought that sanctioning Sayukta Maharashtra with Mumbai mm. is surrendering to the left. Mm. They were rightists. Mm. They were also Marathi. They were rightists, mm. but they did not think that they should be supporting Marathi sentiment because Marathi sentiment will finally be taken over. Mm. by the communist ideology so they wanted to stop the communist and social not only that hara majani editor of lokshatta opposed to mm. the nel the structure of mm. tatma chow because there is a there in the tatma chow uh, structure the statue there yeah. is a boy yeah. and a peasant holding up you know and that worker yeah. and peasant statue exactly partly not exactly but more or less exactly copy of similar yes. statue in moscow so he said this statue will be opposed because that represents mm. the communist ethos <laughs> so well, people like majani and so only lok satta opposed mm. but maratha supported now shakti supported maharashtra mm. times did not exist mm. sakal also opposed mm. sakal also did not support but sakal yeah. was from pune the question was essentially in mumbai yes so uh, the biggest uh, person and uh, people would uh, my mother who used to stay in girgaon at that point of time and i have heard stories about uh, pk atre and his oratory and his uh, you know editorials in maratha so his influence and uh, also the fact that his famous line chinta mani desha cha kanth mani jhala that was the uh, line which he wrote about cd deshmukh giving resignation yeah, yeah. so both these yeah. uh, atre's contribution and cd deshmukh's uh, uh, resignation if you can just tell us more about this how did it atre inspire? was atre definitely was one of the major architects hmm. of sayukta maharashtra movement hmm. major reason being he had a newspaper in his hand and he was a fantastic hmm. speaker he was a rabble rouser as well as a speaker but creating a mass actual base was done by comrade dange and sm hmm. doshi and to a certain extent prabodhan ka thakre and datta deshmukh hmm. because they were working in the unions they were working among the masses and when they were working on the masses they had acharya atre did not have a direct support of organized mass base mm. 
like comrade dange had organized mass base among textile workers mm. emerging engineering workers mm. sm joshi had a large following among the lower middle class la employees in the various organizations socialists also controlled many unions and many organizations so socialists and communists were leading up front from the mass point of view acharya tre was their iconic figure who campaigned vigorously and that's how the campaign became dominant but there were two hope singers like amar sheik and anna bhau sathe these two hope singers were enormously popular in the rural maharashtra and if they had not campaigned hmm. with their poetry and with their folk songs perhaps maharashtra would not have come so as much as acharya atre is involved in getting the entire maharashtra sentiment committed to maharashtra also at amar sheik and anna bhau sathe but at the mass organization level in mumbai is concerned it is a socialist party and a communist party and therefore the fear among the rich and the elite and the privileged was that this is going towards leftism this is going towards socialism and communism so they opposed sakal opposed from pune and loksata opposed from mumbai sir sridhi deshmukh ha uh, uh, sridhi deshmukh actually uh, resigned at that time but sridhi deshmukh did not hmm. exclusively resign on this question he gave that reason that it is being delayed unnecessarily sridhi deshmukh was of the view that center mass should be formed hmm. but sridhi deshmukh resigned because of so many other differences hmm. in the finance ministry hmm. but at that point of time when sridhi deshmukh resigned he saw the sentiment growing that is in 1956 he saw the sentiment growing actually sridhi deshmukh is a person who recommended nationalization of insurance hmm. now that was a leftist demand hmm. and sridhi deshmukh was considered as a rightist because sridhi deshmukh stood on a ticket for president election from a rightist ticket from the jansang ticket and yet sridhi deshmukh was the person who recommended lic's nationalization mm -hmm. that is lic was not lic was created because of nationalization mm -hmm. so sridhi deshmukh took a leftist position even in that financial situation nehru agreed nehru supported it but he had so many other differences so he walked out mm -hmm. but because he walked out at a point and he made that statement he believes in sridhi maharashtra he became chintamani cha kantamani jala but uh, sridhi deshmukh did not actually address mm. a single meeting mm. of sayukt marshal and there were meetings almost every week if not every three days right. in shivaji park in nazula tank in kamgar maidan in azad maidan in cross maidan there is to be every day meeting large meeting mass meeting nowadays the culture doesn't exist mass meeting sridhi deshmukh has not addressed a single mass meeting but sridhi deshmukh supported mm. the sentiment like karve supported the sentiment karve in fact said when he was given bharat ratna karve said before i die he was 99 or 98 that time he said before i die i want to see the birth of sridhi mm -hmm. maharashtra so like mm -hmm. that uh, the sentiment prevailed and that sentiment was supported by many writers many mm -hmm. historians like uh, dawa poddar he was a supporter yeah. of the sridhi maharashtra movement many of the writers supported sridhi maharashtra now those writers were not yeah. working class those writers were not working in a right. textile factory or textile mill but they thought that marathi sentiment has to be strengthened in fact balasaheb thakre prabodhan ka thakre all of them prabodhan thakre started one of the persons under leadership but balasaheb thakre seen from his actual child life uh, young life how sahitya marathi sentiment was created balasaheb thakre retained that pride for maharashtra throughout hmm okay um Uh, we conduct a lot of walks in fort area and many of the british era statues uh, in the early 60s uh, were demolished uh, you know were vandalized and then moved out to bauda jilad museum in baikala uh, like kalagoda ilfit like kalagoda yeah so uh, uh, and also many of the street names uh, in the early 60s uh, many people think that shivsena renamed many of them were renamed long before shivsena was born yeah yeah long how did this all go about because this didn't happen immediately after independence so was sayukta maharashtra movement also responsible for renaming of the streets later on and also vandalization of the statues or it was just how do you look at it i think that uh, that has a little relationship uh, uh, sayukta maharashtra movement did not demolish kalagoda hmm. that is a piece of statue sayukta maharashtra movement actually has not campaigned hmm. for any change of statue or change of name okay. however if somebody demanded like navakar used to demand adilkar used to demand some mm -hmm. such changing of the name and people would support obviously because it is a marathi it should be done like that mm -hmm. but you will find that many statues of the british era are still there mm -hmm. many of the buildings are still there in the fort area yeah. like uh, 
like even khada parsi is there now khada parsi is the only perhaps parsi who will survive entire century but anyway uh, but the point is the demolition of statues was not on the agenda of saint maharashtra changing right. the names also was not but if somebody demanded they would support okay uh, the tag the main line used to be uh, sayukta maharashtra mumbai sayukta maharashtra zhala ts pahije that's the yeah. emphasis and many old timers who were uh, whom i interacted when i was a kid say as long as belgaon karwar nipani uh, are not part of maharashtra it is still not a sayukta maharashtra so uh, you know other areas like kasargod or bhesdai which were other disputes in india which were between states okay. dang region in gujarat yeah. yeah so all these were resolved dang was also some at point of uh, the yeah. but dang umbargao in the yes but 60 years after creation even today you have black uh, flags and uh, marches and you know uh, villages saying that we are part of maharashtra so can you explain how does the, this stay even after 60 years what is the reason and what would be a solution in your view i think that question has been answered by me but point is for instance even in begav and karwar majority of the marathi people are supporters of the sentiment of being marathi Hmm. why actually if you notice the contradiction in goa hmm. maharashtra gomantakwadi party rules hmm. <laughs> but maharashtra gomantakwadi party actually runs a separate goa state hmm. it is not demanding that it should be merged with maharashtra hmm. why maharashtrawadi gomantak party does not want to be part of maharashtra hmm. and still it calls itself as maharashtrawadi gomantak party right. in belgaon karwar there is a strong marathi sentiment among the marathi people and they want to remain here and that sentiment is actually supported by a large scale sentiment in mainly kolhapur and other areas hmm. in mumbai also so they want to do that but unfortunately or fortunately for them unfortunately for us the entire entire issue hmm. has been referred to two committees one is committee and second is supreme court hmm. now supreme court is discussing whether belgaon karwar should be part of maharashtra or not hmm. when supreme court is discussing and every party has said okay let us wait for supreme court hmm. so now supreme court is not coming out because supreme court also knows that the issue is quite delicate i'll give you an interesting example there was bjp ruling in karnataka as well as bjp ruling in maharashtra as well as bjp ruling in delhi mm. so naturally the demand was particularly from shiv sena that you are there in all three parts you are in the karnataka belga belongs there so why don't you simply solve this problem you are in delhi you are in karnataka and you are in maharashtra so you can easily sort out the question it could not be sorted out because everybody would take a position or a refuse in a point that the matter is pending before the supreme court and so many committees are appointed to investigate into the issue so mm. actually that constitutionalism mm. that constitutionalism has prevented the uh, sentiment to getting formalized mm. initially i said that you cannot actually compare mm. or integrate the idea of maharashtra sentiment administration governance and politics mm. sentiment does not necessarily get into the idea of administration does not necessarily give your notions of governance sentiment generates people sentiment mobilizes people but sentiment do not give you the idea of maharashtra that is why after the breakup of the soviet union mm. and so many linguistic linguistic states become independent there is still a governance problem in those in that country or yugoslavia also serbia bosnia croatia they are still struggling to create a governance to create an administrative structure so administrative structure is triggered by sentiment That's but right. administrative structure does not emerge out of sentiment right and therefore the belgaon karwar issue is alive because sentiment is still alive okay. but administrative structure has not emerged and that's why in belgaon for instance in karnataka there is a bjp government till recently in maharashtra there was a bjp government mm-hmm. in delhi there was narendra modi bjp government but belgaon karwar issue not only could not be solved right. the bjp in karnataka set up belgaon as its second capital yeah and it created a big house assembly there right and that was only to rub the uh, you know kind of injury of the right. marathi sentiment sir uh, all, sentiment will prevail yeah. sentiment will yeah all the industrialist and the capitalist at that point of time created a bombay citizens uh, committee which is ironic yeah. because it was not citizens it was only 12 13 very very rich gujarati speaking yeah. people only uh, elitist elitist class of south yeah. mumbai 
Yeah. That time Bandra had not become elitist. Yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, even JRD Tata was uh, part of it. Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. the question I'm asking is, what was the general Parsi sentiment? Uh, middle class party Parsi sentiment was anti Sayukta Maharashtra or pro Sayukta Maharashtra? No, middle class was supporting Maharashtra completely. Okay. By and large, I mean, if you took a survey, at that time opinion poll system didn't exist. But yeah. if opinion poll was taken, I think 90% of the Marathi middle class would have supported uh, yeah. Maharashtra. And par Parsis, really? uh, middle class Parsis? Parsis. Yeah. Middle class Parsis were supporting, the owner class, the elite class was not supporting. Okay. Like Alec Padamsi would not be supporting, J.R.D. Tata may not be supporting, Palkiwala yeah. may not be supporting. Yeah. But the Parsis yeah. who were working in so many places, shops and establishments, yeah. and even in the loan management cadre, they were yeah. sympathetic because they were interacting with Marathi people every day. So yes. they could easily understand the Marathi sentiment. Yeah. Uh, one question from my side. In terms of in terms of population, the Parsi population is so small yeah. that uh, whether as a community they supported or not mattered yeah. only as a story in a newspaper. It did not matter on the street. <laughs> right. Um, we are seeing a shift of communist vote from communism, that is leftism, in Bengal today, to going towards uh, BJP, which is right to right wing. Uh, yeah. Do you see any parallels between the shift in communist to Shiv Sen and Mumbai in the 60s and 70s uh, and what is happening in Bengal too? Very much because even murder of Krishna Desai, yes. the militant comrade in Lalwar, yeah. that murder was done by those young boys in the age group of 20 to 30. Yeah. They were all sons of the comrades in Lalwar region. Yeah. The reason being the frustration, I think that's a long subject, I'll just give you a very simple uh, kind of uh, narrative. 1960, Maharashtra was created. Yes. So, Sayyidka Maharashtra Samiti, which led the movement for Mumbai, Sir Sayyidka Maharashtra Paije, was dissolved after Maharashtra was formed. Mm. Yashundra Chavan, who belonged to Congress and always thought Nehru as a leader, became the Chief Minister of Maharashtra despite originally being with the Nehru line, Congress line, which was not fully sympathetic to Sayyid Kumar at the moment. Right. But he became Chief Minister of Maharashtra. And in fact, he openly said in the Shivaji Park meeting that his approach of creating Sayyid Kumar Maharashtra was different. Hmm. He was not opposed to the idea of Sayyid Kumar Maharashtra. Hmm. His approach was different. And that's how he became Chief Minister. And later on, he became Defense Minister. Right. Now, at that time, Maharashtra was created, but there was no roadmap. Hmm for industrializing Maharashtra or creating working class uh, opportunity. So as a result between 1962 and 1965, 1966, when the entire global economic crisis came and the World Bank started issuing orders to India, unemployment began to rise. There is a big author named Gunnar Mirdal who wrote a book called Asian Drama and he found out that India is suffering a lot because of rising population, unemployment, lack of resources, lack of investment, no industry. And at that time, the burnt of all that absence of investment, non-creation of industry was being actually taken on the head by the Marathi young people in Mumbai. And such industrial unemployment, there is a difference between industrial unemployment and agricultural unemployment. When agricultural land is not able to provide for all the members of the family in that area, then naturally there is a surplus on the land and they migrate to cities. But in cities, when they come, they become workers. And when they become industrial workers, or those who get educated, and become educated unemployed, so educated unemployed, industrially trained unemployed, and agriculturally unemployed are not the same. So naturally, those workers were supporting communist movement. When they found, by something like 1965-66, the jobs are not coming, investment is not coming, but communists had represented the self Maharashtra movement. So what is their use? So those who were demanding jobs for Marathi people, that is Shiv Sena, they said, okay, let us try this. And so they went, because Shiv Sena has taken a militant position on the question of jobs to Marathi, and Marathi people had naturally expected that jobs should come to them, because Maharashtra was formed in 1960. Why should jobs not come? Because essentially the working class fought for Sayyid to Maharashtra, Right. They fought against the Gujarati and Marwadi ownership. So it was a class conflict also. Now we have fought. We have got Mumbai. Mm. And still we don't have jobs. Mm. So who is promising jobs? Shiv Sena is promising jobs. Right. So let us go to Shiv Sena. So, right. And that's why you will find that Uddhav Thakre, 
Mm. Despite having grown in the anti-communist atmosphere of Shiv Sena, mm. you will find Balasheb Thakre invited Comrade Dange yes. to address Shiv Sainiks in Shivaji Park. Yes. And yes. Sanjay Raut openly takes pride in saying that Bal Thakre invited Comrade Dange. Mm. And not only that, when Bal Thakre was asked in an interview, I think which was a televised interview, mm. who were the people who influenced him most? Mm. He said Comrade Dange. Yes, yes. So, despite being in that anti-communist atmosphere, Maharaj mm. Thakre said Comrade Dange influenced him. So, Great. that was the kind of, you can say, symbiotic relationship or dialectical relationship yes. or what you can call a, a very negative, positive relationship. Yes. Uh, last two questions. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, one is, there are two characters in this whole thing which I've looked at very negatively uh, by Maharashtrians. I'm not even involving Chacha Nehru into this. Uh, Saka Patil, who being a Marathi, was against this. And the other was, of course, the villain of the whole piece, according to most Marathi people at that point of time, Moraji Desai. So how do you look at their roles uh, into this? And uh, what was the thought going on in their minds probably uh, at that point of time? Something, whatever you can give an insight into these two characters. For Moraji Desai, it is easy to answer because Moraji Desai himself was a Gujarati. Yeah. The fight was going on against the Gujarati and Marathi ownership. Yes. Moraji Desai was openly supporting either bilingual state or union territory. Yeah. He did not want Mumbai to go to Maharashtra. So mm -hmm. entire Gujarat state, Gujarat mm -hmm. state became later, Gujarati community in that part and Gujarati community in Mumbai supported Moraji Desai. Mm -hmm. What happened was this firing whom we call martyrs at Kutatma Chow. Those martyrs were created out of the firing done by Moraji Desai government. So naturally the sentiment and the hatred towards Moraji Desai was directly related to the killing of 106 or 107 people in the mass movement. He's, hap he's happening to be Gujarati and Gujarati lobby supporting Moraji Desai. So that was obvious. As far as Sakapatil is concerned, Sakapatil belongs to Kokan region. Right. And Shaka Patil was same person in Maharashtra. But Shaka Patil was a person who was stridently anti-left, anti-communist, and therefore anti-Dange, anti-SM Doshi, and so on. And therefore, he was fully supported mm. by the Gujarati Marwadi business community. Right. So anybody who supported, who was supported by business community, mm. the Marathi sentiment went against him. And then SK Patil Moraji came together. Mm. But at the time of Moraji becoming Prime Minister, Mm. SK Patil did not support Moraji immediately, he supported Lalbadu Shastri. Mm. So there was a division in that also. But apart from that, the point is Moraji and Saka Patil or SK Patil became villains because they supported or they went against the mass sentiment of being Marathi. Right. Sir, any books you would recommend uh, on this uh, Sayukta Maharashtra related? What books today's people who are young, who are 20, 25, what should they read? They must read. Yadi Fatke, YD Fatke's, mm. I think six or seven volume mm. survey of Maharashtra politics mm. from 1900 to something like 1970, 1980. Mm. I think that is the best. It gives everything in a documented form. Lovely. There is no prejudice or there is no bias. Okay. Everything is very properly studied there. Okay. For English, there is a book called Linguistic Reorganization of India. Great. And the, the, there are two, three books on that. Yeah. Linguistic Reorganization of India. That you can just go to the next and you will find one of them. Yes. But in Marathi, why do you book is the best? Yeah. So now we have come to the end of the talk. Last question from my side. I'm and then Acharya Atri's autobiography is there. Yes, 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 yes certainly. Um, uh, we have come to the end of the talk today, sir. Uh, there are many other questions, but I, I can't take all of them. So, uh, uh, I'm just comparing two of the states, uh, two of the cities at that point of time, very important cities. Uh, one was Bombay and the other was Madras. And uh, Madras was not an exclusive Tamil-speaking city at that point of time. Telugu film industry, uh, Telugu-speaking uh, liter literati at that point of time, all were based out of Madras, right? And uh, after creation of Tamil Nadu, they had to relocate and move out of Madras, right? Uh, as compared to that, this did not happen in Mumbai, right? Uh, uh, in Mumbai, Shankar Dev gave a promise at that point of time that let Mumbai be a part of Maharashtra and will ensure that it will become uh, remain cosmopolitan. The fact that uh, Mumbai, uh, the Marathi percentage in Mumbai has come down 
from 52 to hourly 32 today and in madras it was never 52 huh? oh yeah it was never 52% now huh. okay it was never crossing 50% it yeah, was it less was than 50%. So 50 now it is something like 30% yeah so now it has come down to 30 yeah so, yeah so uh, the question i'm asking you right at the end uh, that mumbai has remained uh, uh, cosmopolitan in spite of marathi presence or because of marathi largesse so where how do you look at it well cosmopolitanism of mumbai has changed over the period i will not say it is as cosmopolitan as it was in the 60s and 70s okay. despite marathi was formed shivsena was there yeah. working class movement was there it was more cosmopolitan between 60 and 1980 mm. than it is today. Today, it is un unfortunately quite divided, not on the language lines, but so many language, religion, mm. uh, you know, kind of lifestyles, mm. and of course, the class division, yeah. and uh, the rich and the poor, and the slum and the non-slum. For instance, today, yeah. the middle class is a very powerful community in Mumbai. Mm. There are something like, if I am not mistaken, 37,000. Cooperative housing societies of 1 BHK, 2 BHK, 3 BHK, and 4 mm -hmm. BHK. Then there are some gated societies. Mm -hmm. They are all middle class. Middle class born after 1980 or 1990 post liberalization. Yes. Now that middle class has zero understanding of Dharavi slums, of Mankut slums. They don't understand that. Majority of the domestic servants or many other menial workers come from that area, but the middle class does not have according to me, adequate understanding, adequate empathy or adequate sympathy for that class, they are also Marathi. But they do not have that, uh, what you can call empathetic feeling or sympathetic feeling or compassion and consideration towards that class. So middle class is now an independent, autonomous entity in Mumbai. At that time, such middle class did not exist. Right. And that middle class, we supported Shiv Sena and that middle class, same middle class so supporting communists also. Mm -hmm. But that middle class retained the cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. Same middle class would attend Acharya Atri's lectures and would rush to attend Palkiwala's lecture. Right. There was no contradiction in that because Mumbai was cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. Nobody discussed, nobody discussed in the films in the context of religion or caste. Nobody discussed. Mm -hmm. Like nobody thought that Dilip Kumar was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought that Rajkapur came from Lahore. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought that the Muslim uh, Kind of actors and actresses, Nargis was Muslim, Minakumari was Muslim, Madhuwala was Muslim, Vaidar Rahman was Muslim, but nobody thought in those terms. Mm. Today, you will find very recently, particularly, how they ridicule mm. by calling the three Khans as Khanavar mm. while they rush for the films. Mm. But that sentiment of hatred has been built up. Mm. Now, that kind of cosmopolitanism is not there in Mumbai today, which existed and I have seen between 1960 and 1980. The culture was completely cosmopolitan. Like Nasiruddin Shah would not be trolled mm. just because he took a different line. Mm. Amir Khan would not be trolled just because he took a different line. Mm. At that time, the entire film industry, entire Bollywood, the entire cricket represented the true cosmopolitanism. Today, it is not so. Mm. So I will not compare two cosmopolitanism. Coming to Chennai or Madras, mm. you must have known that neither MGR nor Jailalitha mm. belong to Tamil community. Yes. They are not Tamils. Mm. Karunaridhi was Tamil. Yes. But Jailalita and MGR are so popular. Mm. MGR was Malayali and Jailalita is Mysore. Yeah. So she is from Mysore. Now, Chennai's character was that. Chennai, actually Madras, Tamil Nadu state came much later. Mm. Madras was a major area. Yeah. In that there was Kannada people, that is Karnataka, Telugu and Tamil and Malayali. All four, the center was Chennai or Madras. Similarly, Calcutta was a center for Odisha, for Bihar, and even partly for Northeast, mm. Assam. So, Calcutta also had that cosmopolitanism. Mumbai, Calcutta, and Chennai had this regional context of cosmopolitanism. Mm. But Mumbai was different because Mumbai was also a trading center, mm. which Chennai was not. Mm. And Calcutta was, but that was in the last century. Mm. But Mumbai continued, and even today, Mumbai is the main port main airport and main trading center. That's why Mumbai Stock Exchange is quoted even on New York Stock Exchange right. or Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Calcutta Stock Exchange is not quoted internationally because Mumbai remains the international global trade center. So that part of cosmopolitanism still exists in Mumbai. Yeah. But the kind of cultural cosmopolitanism, 
social cosmopolitanism that existed between 1960 and 1980, despite Shiv Sena yeah. being there or communists being there, that is not there today.